that then prostate cancer is probably the most prominent disease where this is uh, uh, practiced. And there's been a, a tremendous amount of growth, actually, over the past five or 10 years in the knowledge around active surveillance of prostate cancer. So this first slide is actually a Google search from 2009. Uh, active surveillance for prostate cancer revealed about 63,000 results at that point in time. This year, the same search reveals over 350,000 results. And this just reflects the increasing volume of activity in this space. This is similarly noted in the academic literature where a PubMed search of the same search terms shows that the results by year has exploded over the last five or 10 years. This is clearly an area of great interest and there's been a lot of uh, new developments that help inform our understanding of how this fits into prostate cancer care. So in my talk today, I'm going to go over uh, these five points, uh, point by point, and uh, then at the end, we'll have some time for questions if anyone's interested. First of all, the concept and rationale. So when we present this option to patients in the clinic, the first question that almost everyone asks is, how can I possibly have a cancer diagnosis come to see you in the oncology clinic and be talking about an option, any, any option other than immediately treating this cancer? How do we know who can be safely monitored and how is that monitoring performed? And if I choose this option, will the window of opportunity for cure close? So active surveillance, as we currently define it, is, is uh, defined by the careful selection of men at low risk of harm from prostate cancer without treatment, the careful monitoring of those who select surveillance for evidence of progression, and then the initiation of curative treatment of men who have disease progression. And we believe this is initiated while the window of opportunity for cure is still open. So by way of background, there have been some pretty dramatic changes in prostate cancer outcomes in the U.S. over the past several decades. And these uh, have several different contributing factors. The description of anatomic radical prostatectomy by Dr. Patrick Walsh in 1983 opened up the door for prostate cancer treatment with reduced side effects and uh, improved outcomes. Over the subsequent decade, we saw a 50% increase in the proportion of men undergoing surgery. And then around 1990, PSA testing became widespread in the United States. Subsequently, over the following decade, there was observed a 30% decline in prostate cancer mortality. And today, since 1990, we've seen a greater than 40% decline in prostate cancer mortality. So we believe the combination of screening and effective treatment has really improved the outcomes of men with this very common cancer. Against that background, the news in 2012 from the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommending against PSA screening sometimes can be a source of confusion for patients and, and even uh, physicians. And understanding where these recommendations are motivated from helps to frame why we believe active surveillance is a particularly important innovation in prostate cancer care. The task force recommendations came from the recognition of the potential for harm from prostate cancer screening and specifically the possibility of unnecessary testing, overdiagnosis, and overtreatment. The concept of overdiagnosis is supported by epidemiological evidence demonstrating that the risk of prostate cancer diagnosis in screened populations, and the U.S. is a, a, a canonical example of a screened population, is significantly higher than in unscreened populations. And this is reflected by the lifetime risk of prostate cancer diagnosis uh, prior to PSA screening being on the order of about 1 in 10. Subsequently, since prostate cancer screening has become widespread, the lifetime risk of prostate cancer diagnosis is more on the order of about 1 in 6. And these data are often presented as evidence of overdiagnosis, although I think it's important to point out that even prior to the introduction of PSA screening, which technically uh, began in about 1987, but really took off in the 1990s. Uh, there was initially a huge spike in prostate cancer incidence as men with prevalent disease were detected in the population, but then the, the rate leveled off at a new baseline. However, if you look at the trajectory of prostate cancer incidence prior to PSA screening, it almost draws a straight line out to where we are today. So I think it's a little bit unclear that PSA screening per se is is the only thing to blame for the, the higher rates of prostate cancer we're seeing now. I think it's a complicated picture, likely reflecting an aging population and reduced mortality from other causes. But in any event, uh, there are concerns about overdiagnosis and subsequently overtreatment of prostate cancer. 
these data are from an observational study in Connecticut that demonstrate that prostate cancer probably, like many cancers, is not really one disease and that within the monolithic group of men diagnosed with prostate cancer, there are important subgroups defined by reproducible factors that are associated with the specific risk of, a, of an individual's diagnosis of prostate cancer relative to others. And the figure reproduced here shows in the dark shaded bars <coughs> the proportion of men who died from prostate cancer, prostate cancer specific mortality. The rows reflect the different Gleason score groups, and Gleason score is the grading system we use for prostate cancer. In the top row, Gleason 6, uh, corresponding to what we can currently define as low risk disease. In the bottom row, Gleason 8 to 10, what, what we currently define as uh, high risk localized disease. And, and there's clearly differences between these groups in terms of the cancer specific risk based primarily on Gleason score. By way of uh, perspective relative to other common cancers for which screening is recommended, Another piece of evidence that's held out as uh, evidence of overtreatment is the number needed to screen and the number needed to treat figures that are calculated from the screening trials. And the top row, the ERSPC, is the European Randomized Study of Prostate Cancer Screening, probably the best study of PSA screening. And in the initial analyses from that study, the number of men needed to screen to save one life was on the order of 1,400, and the number needed to treat was 48. And importantly, that's at the nine-year follow-up interval. Subsequent follow-up studies have demonstrated the number of needed to treat going down as, as uh, follow-up accumulates in those studies. And I think it's important to note that the, the way that the number needed to treat statistic is calculated actually would overestimate that number for prostate cancer to the extent that we use active surveillance and, and diagnose some men, but, but avoid treatment in those with low risk disease. Again, the controversy and the concern about overtreatment is in, in, in contrast to breast cancer or colorectal cancer, where the number needed to treat is significantly lower. So a variety of approaches have been proposed to reduce overtreatment of prostate cancer. There's a great interest in developing new biomarkers to reduce unnecessary biopsies and specifically identify those cases with aggressive disease. There have been recommendations to reduce screening in older men. And then there's a, a great interest in, in increasing the utilization of active surveillance for low-risk cancer, particularly in older men. And that really is the focus of our talk today. So <clears throat> when we talk about active surveillance, this is based on carefully selecting the men who we believe have uh, low risk of progression, and then outlining some sort of follow-up plan to do continuous risk reassessment to make sure that we don't see any signals of disease that actually warrants treatment. A variety of recommendations for these have been proposed. Probably the best, uh, most recognized recommendations are those from the NCCN guidelines, and these are fairly consistent with what uh, is being done in clinical practice these days. So the NCCN guidelines are laid out with a variety of uh, organizational schemes that I think help make sense of this whole picture. First of all, the recommendations are, are stratified by the recurrence risk of the cancer diagnosis. Secondly, by the expected patient survival. And then based on those strata, therapy recommendations are made. So the lowest risk strata is called very low risk, and this is defined by non-palpable, at least in six or less disease with a relatively lower PSA, PSA less than 10, and a low volume of disease as estimated by the amount of biopsy material involved, specifically fewer than three prostate biopsy cores positive and less than 50% cancer in any positive core. These criteria have been demonstrated in, in a variety of studies to reliably predict on the order of 80 to five, 85 to 90% reliability, uh, low volume, low grade disease. These define the very low risk group in the NCCN guidelines. And interestingly, for men with a less than 20-year life expectancy, men with that kind of prostate cancer, active surveillance is the only treatment recommended by the NCCN guidelines. For men with a greater than or equal to 20-year life expectancy, the recommendations uh, are more in line with uh, the low-risk group outlined below. The low-risk group is similar to the very low-risk group, uh, with the caveat that this group also includes patients with relatively higher volume disease, so maybe three, four, five cores of least in six disease, and not quite as strict as, as the definition for the very low risk group. For this group, again, for the less than 10 year life expectancy, surveillance is the only recommended option. And for those men with low risk disease and a greater than 10 year life expectancy, 
The options outlined include surveillance, radiation in the form of external beam radiation or brachytherapy, and surgical removal. The next page on the NCCM guidelines outlines the recommendations for intermediate risk disease. And this is defined by Gleason score of 7 and or PSA of 10 to 20. In this group, when the life expectancy is less than 10 years, surveillance is still an option. Uh, or in, in cases where treatment is desired, radiation is, is recommended as the option in the form of external beam radiation therapy. <clears throat> For men with a greater than 10-year life expectancy, surgery or radiation are recommended. And I think these, these recommendations are interesting when we consider the U.S. population where the average age at prostate cancer diagnosis is 67 years. For the average U.S. male of 67 years of age, uh, the actuarial life expectancy is 15.8 years. The threshold at which the average life expectancy is greater than 20 years is 61 years old, and the threshold at which the average life expectancy is less than 10 years is 77 years old, and these are from Social Security life tables. So selection of men in uh, published series of active surveillance are closely mirror those outlined in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, a variety of multi-institutional series have been published. Uh, a large prospective series from Toronto has been published uh, numerous times, and a large prospective series from Johns Hopkins has uh, been published, and, and these data really inform our understanding of what the outcomes of surveillance are. The follow-up outlined in the different North American programs, again, is fairly similar to those recommended in the NCCN guidelines. There's not a clearly defined rule of uh, what follow-up should entail, but in general, they involve serial reassessment of the rectal examination and PSA and repeat biopsies on a variety of different schedules. In the multi-institutional series, uh, there was a retrospective series. They uh, did a biopsy 18 months after enrollment and then every one to three years. In the Toronto series, the criterion for progression was primarily based on PSA and biopsy was done less frequently, about every three to four years. And in the Johns Hopkins series, biopsy was actually recommended to be done annually. So a, a variety of different schedules have been outlined, and the differences between these different programs actually have helped to inform our understanding of, of the trade-offs of different approaches to risk reassessment and surveillance. An open question for men considering surveillance is whether or not they should undergo a confirmatory biopsy at initiation. This is based on the knowledge that despite the well-established clinical standard of uh, 12 core prostate biopsy, as uh, the diagnostic tool of choice for prostate cancer, that there is a possibility for sampling error. And particularly for patients who are healthier, younger, uh, where, where we may be a little bit more on the fence of whether surveillance is the option, we'll often recommend a confirmatory biopsy shortly after the initial diagnostic biopsy just to make sure that the misclassification hasn't occurred because we recognize that about 10 to 15 percent of men will actually be found to have higher grade or higher volume disease on that first biopsy. The, in the next series, we'll talk about triggers for intervention and prediction of progression. Again, in the, the different series that have been published, uh, a variety of criteria have been used for, to answer this question. In the multi-institutional study, it was a retrospective study, so it was not pre-specified, and a variety of criteria were used, um, generally consistent with, uh, with the other uh, prospective studies. In the Toronto experience, again, it was a prospectively defined study. The primary, primary criterion for progression was PSA velocity or a rapidly rising PSA. Uh, this series also enrolled men with Gleason 3 plus 4 disease, and biopsy progression was defined as uh, progressing to Gleason 4 plus 3 or greater. In the Johns Hopkins experience, this was the strictest uh, enrollment criteria, uh, very consistent with the NCCN guidelines, very low risk disease definition. And in, in that uh, experience, the progression was defined as progression to Gleason score 3 plus 4 or greater, or greater than 50% of a core positive, or greater than two cores positive. And later on uh, in the experience, they actually adjusted to also include a progression with respect to PSA density. And so there's a sort of a spectrum of different experiences that have been published in terms of strictness of defining progression on surveillance. In general, Factors associated with intervention on surveillance, I think, are fairly common sense. Younger men uh, tend to have a lower threshold for pr proceeding to treatment. 
uh, men with a higher baseline PSA or a rapidly rising PSA tend to uh, go on to treatment. Men with a higher clinical stage of baseline palpable disease uh, often have a lower threshold for treatment. And higher Gleason score, a higher percentage of positive cores uh, in the baseline biopsy have been associated with the progression to treatment. Uh, those men who have a positive rebiopsy uh, also have tended to uh, go on to intervention. A question has arisen whether we could spare men the repeat biopsies and just focus on the PSA kinetics as a way to uh, try to minimize the burden of surveillance. In general, PSA doubling time or PSA uh, velocity have been associated with the likelihood of treatment while on surveillance, primarily in those series where rising PSA is the, is the predefined trigger for intervention. This is specifically relevant to the Toronto experience. The predefined progression criterion in Toronto was a PSA doubling time, initially of two years revised to three years or less. Uh, and it's important to contextualize that, that this corresponds to a PSA velocity of one to two nanograms per mil per year in men whose baseline PSA is in the four to 10 range. Uh, the a PSA velocity of two nanograms per year rise from say four to six over the year prior to diagnosis has actually been associated with prostate cancer specific mortality in treated populations. So this is a fairly high bar uh, for defining progression. And interestingly, there was an 8.5 times greater risk of PSA progression after treatment uh, in those men with a PSA rising that quickly. And that's a published experience from the Toronto series. Uh, so we believe in our practice, at least, that the value of PSA kinetics for triggering intervention during the window of curability is unproven. And we tend to still recommend repeat biopsies consistent with the NCCN guidelines. This is a study from the Hopkins experience. Again, a, a population of patients where progression was defined primarily by biopsy progression and where all patients underwent annual biopsy per protocol in a prospectively defined uh, plan. And they went back and retrospectively looked at how informative the PSA kinetics were in these patients of identifying those cases with uh, uh, adverse characteristics. And in, in that series, uh, they were not impressed that PSA could replace biopsy and, and still recommend uh, repeating the biopsies to try to identify those cases while the window of opportunity for cure is still open. Another few studies from the Hopkins experience that have been informative in terms of understanding factors that can predict subsequent progression uh, have focused on the outcomes of the surveillance biopsy. Again, in the Hopkins experience, the surveillance biopsies in all men who are enrolled in the protocol were, were scheduled to be done on an annual basis. So in a large cohort of men, we have developed a significant experience to inform our understanding of what these subsequent biopsies can tell us about downstream outcomes. So in a retrospective study published in 2010, they focused on factors <laughs> associated with progression on that first surveillance biopsy. And looking at the free PSA and biopsy core involvement, those men who had a relatively higher free PSA, and, and free PSA is a, an adjunct to PSA testing that at low levels, at low percentages, actually is associated with a higher likelihood of prostate cancer diagnosis in the screening setting. They look, looked at it in a population of men who were diagnosed, a higher free PSA and a lower percentage of biopsy core involvement had a relatively low risk of progression at that first biopsy, 7.6%. In contrast, the opposite group of men, those who had a low free PSA and a relatively higher biopsy core involvement had about a 29% risk of progression at that first biopsy. And so, <clears throat> This helps to define uh, for, for men at the baseline, at the decision-making phase of you know, whether to undergo biopsy, these are some factors that can help to identify men who might have a higher and or lower chance of early progression on surveillance and, and potentially considering treatment or uh, earlier confirmatory biopsy. This slide from the same study looks at prediction of progression three years after the first surveillance biopsy. So this, this slide reflects the results of that first surveillance biopsy. So a man was uh, decided to do surveillance, enrolled in the program, came back one year later for his first surveillance biopsy. And these data were stratified based on PSA density and whether or not the first biopsy showed cancer. So among those men who had a low PSA density, and this is a, a number that we use to adjust the PSA value for the size of the prostate, so a man with a large prostate will have 
a lower PSA density for any given PSA number, then will a man with a small prostate sort of corrects for BPH. <clears throat> and that man with a low PSA density and a first biopsy that showed no cancer actually had an 11% risk at three years of progressing on biopsy. And this is, again, by the Hopkins criteria, which are very strict definitions of biopsy progression. In contrast, a man with a relatively higher PSA density and a repeat biopsy confirming prostate cancer, and, and again, this is even sort of low volume, low risk disease, three years later has a greater than 50% chance of progressing uh, either in grade or volume. And in between, uh, the rates are in between. And so basically the, the Hopkins experience has provided a window for us to understand a little bit more what some additional factors that can stratify the risk and outcomes of surveillance are. Uh, these, I think, provide opportunities for personalized follow-up regimens now that this very strict prospectively defined cohort has started to mature we can start to identify people where we might be able to spare them additional biopsies with some degree of confidence. The outcomes of surveillance are, uh, again, mostly informed from the uh, large series that have been published. The Johns Hopkins program is a relatively representative one. In this group, uh, approximately 900 men have been followed for a median of eight years. <clears throat> Over half remain on surveillance about a third have undergone curative intervention. Uh, only very small percent, 4% have been lost to follow-up, 2% have died of other causes, and 7% just withdrew from the study, so we're uncertain of their outcomes. The likelihood of remaining on surveillance in the North American programs uh, is uh, fairly similar. Uh, lower likelihood in the Hopkins program because, again, they had very, very strict criteria for defining progression. And so in that experience, uh, it was a, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the title slide seems to have slid over. The uh, five-year rate was 47%. The 10-year rate was 23%. Um, in the Toronto experience, the corresponding numbers were 72 and 62%. And again, these populations are a little bit different. In the multi-institutional experience, reflecting, I think, the, the more widespread clinical practice outside of a prospectively defined protocol, 75% of men uh, remained on surveillance at five years. Reasons for curative intervention on surveillance, uh, again, depended somewhat in the prospective series on predefined criteria. So in the Toronto experience, a significant number uh, who went on to curative intervention did so because of short PSA doubling time. In the Hopkins experience, a larger percentage uh, underwent treatment based on biopsy changes. But a significant number in both series, a little bit larger in the Hopkins experience, uh, underwent treatment without any evidence of progression where it was really just a matter of patient's preference and, and for one reason or another, deciding that they no longer wanted to be on surveillance and wanted to go into treatment. And again, this, these numbers here reflect about a third of the men who uh, initially chose surveillance went on to curative intervention. The outcomes of surveillance in terms of cancer-specific outcomes in the Hopkins experience have been defined in terms of biopsy progression, specifically in terms of grade progression of uh, a subsequent biopsy demonstrating Gleason score 3 plus 4 or greater, and then the broader uh, criterion of any progression, either uh, grade progression or volume progression. So a patient who still had Gleason 6 disease but maybe had a repeat biopsy with 60% of a core positive or three or four cores positive. And this, this figure here demonstrates that by that looser definition, uh, about 50% of the men reached one or the other of those criteria by eight years. Less than 50% of men had grade progression, uh, and the median uh, grade progression-free survival was not reached in this study. The pathological outcomes of surgically treated surveillance patients are generally favorable. Uh, in the Hopkins experience, uh, there were a small number of patients with known positive disease, but importantly, none of those met the strict inclusion criteria. And so we, again, believe that the inclusion criteria uh, carefully identify men with a low risk of progression. Uh, they actually did a comparison of delayed and immediate surgical intervention at Hopkins, uh, comparing the 107 men at that time who had undergone surgery after an initial period of surveillance to men who met surveillance criteria but elected to undergo surgery immediately and did a three-to-one matched uh, comparison study 
based on uh, surgical pathology outcomes. In this experience, uh, there was a significant difference in the rate of organ-confined disease. Uh, positive margins was not significant. There was a higher uh, grade in the delayed surgery, and the predicted 10-year biochemical re recurrence-free survival was slightly lower in the, um, <coughs> uh, pardon me, the biochemical progression was slightly higher in the uh, delayed surgery patients. But it's important to recognize that these don't really compare apples to apples in the sense that a significant portion of the men who underwent delayed in intervention on the uh, initial surveillance arm had grade progression. And so <clears throat> when they compared surveillance subjects without biopsy grade change to those who underwent immediate surgery, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups in terms of the Gleason score of the surgical specimen. Comparing the patients who underwent uh, delayed surgery with a biopsy grade change. There was, however, significant difference, and there was a significant difference between those who underwent immediate surgery and those who had a delayed intervention without grade change. And so uh, overall, these results were reassuring that among patients who uh, initially chose surveillance that the, the outcomes were favorable. The PSA recurrence rate survival comparing delayed versus immediate surgery was not statistically different. And the PSA free survival in 117 men treated with curative intent in the Toronto experience are, is demonstrated on this figure. Again, the Toronto experience included men with intermediate risk disease and had a relatively higher threshold for intervention. But nonetheless, the cause-specific survival in the Toronto experience at five years was 99.7% and at 10 years was 97.2%. The overall survival was 68% at 10 years, again, reflecting the fact that prostate cancer is commonly diagnosed in older men with competing health risks. So in general, the outcomes of active surveillance are that approximately a third of men will undergo treatment within three to five years, driven by a variety of factors, including the specifications of an individual protocol, uh, and largely by patient preferences. Grade progression occurs in a subset of men, but it's unclear whether this actually represents initial misclassification versus true progression to a higher risk lesion. And for this reason, we, we do recommend consideration of confirmatory biopsy, particularly in a younger man or a man who's really more on the fence about surveillance, recognizing that there's about a 10 to 15 percent rate of misclassification. With limited follow-up, ESA progression-free survival appears to be similar for men undergoing immediate versus delayed intervention, among, particularly among patients on the more conservative protocol outlined by the Hopkins experience. And the cancer-specific survival appears to be greater than 95% at five to 10 years follow-up. There are limited data on biopsy-related complications, but this is an important topic and one that has been recognized, particularly in the past few years, in some observational data from Sierra Medicare, which have suggested that uh, the prevalence of quinolone-resistant bacteria in the U.S. population appears to be rising, and that the potential for biopsy-related infectious complications may be slightly higher than it was in prior years. Despite the enthusiasm for prostate cancer active surveillance outlined in the Google and PubMed searches at the beginning of this talk, uh, surveillance remains a relatively uncommon management option. And this, these data are from CAPTURE, a large multi-institutional registry, uh, looking from the early 90s to the mid-2000s, uh, when surveillance among men with low-risk disease, and again, this isn't all comers, this is men for whom surveillance is really recommended as a, as a very viable option. Uh, the, the, the actual utilization and uptake of this practice in the community has been relatively low, uh, essentially less than 10 percent. A subsequent study in the same data set focused specifically on the subgroup with very low risk disease showed, again, about 10 to 15 percent rates of utilization of surveillance in that group. So we think that there's a significant opportunity for improvement of disseminating the uh, rationale for and the outcomes of surveillance and using surveillance as a way of uh, mitigating the risks of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And I think this is particularly relevant when we consider uh, a study from one of the uh, primary level one evidence uh, pieces available to suggest that prostate cancer treatment has mortality benefit. This is from the Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Group Study 4, and this is a study that randomized men to <coughs> surgery versus 
observation, not active surveillance uh, by the criteria that we're discussing today, but the traditional concept of watchful waiting uh, with treatment only initiated in the, in the evidence of metastatic disease. And this is also, again, importantly, a largely clinically detected group of patients, not a PSA screened population. And in this group overall, there was an absolute reduction in prostate cancer specific death of 5.4% at 12 years with a number needed to treat of 19. However, when the cohort was stratified based on age less than or greater than or equal to 65 years, the number needed to treat for men less than 65 years was only nine. However, for men greater than or equal to 65 years, it was 1,000. And so I think these data could actually be presented as level one evidence supporting active surveillance for low-risk prostate cancer in older men. Uh, when compared to no treatment for localized prostate cancer, treatment resulted in no significant reduction in rates of cancer death or metastatic disease for men over the age of 65 after 12 years of follow-up, and again, in a group of men who were largely uh, an unscreened population. So these were clinically detected prostate cancers uh, for the most part. I think based on the, the, the sort of careful risk reassessment and close follow-up that we use in contemporary active surveillance programs, the safety of active surveillance relative to this uh, the watchful waiting strategy employed in this study is uh, even stronger. A variety of reasons have been suggested to explain the apparent underutilization of active surveillance. I think there's a natural physician and patient fear of missing an opportunity for cure. There is a fundamentally some uncertainty in everything we do in medicine, but in this area, uh, we do believe that we have a variety of criteria that can help us identify those cases that have a very low risk of uh, adverse outcomes. Uh, related to that is the litigious healthcare environment in the United States uh, and uh, the, the concern about missing an opportunity for cure. Practice patterns are something that are uh, very slow to change in medicine, uh, but the, the uh, academic interest in active surveillance, and I think in, in a lot of respects, the controversy around PSA screening will provide greater motivation for us to revisit the role of active surveillance and something we can do to improve the quality of prostate cancer care. And finally, under the current reimbursement structure we have, uh, the monetary motivations for treatment are, are there, and um, it may be that you know, they drive patterns of care to some degree also. So the art of prostate cancer management in 2013 is really trying to shift the balance toward benefit away from harm. And we believe we can accomplish this by preferentially detecting and treating lethal disease versus everything we find. An increase in the utilization of active surveillance for low-risk disease could provide a means of uncoupling diagnosis and treatment and reducing the burdens of overdiagnosis. A variety of important opportunities for research have been identified. The NIH convened a state of the science conference on the role of active surveillance in the management of men with localized prostate cancer, and they have an excellent review of this topic available free online for anyone who's interested. But in their summary statement, they talked about the specific needs in this area being uh, improvements in the accuracy and consistency of pathologic diagnosis, uh, improving the consensus of which men are the best candidates, optimizing the protocol for surveillance, and, and specifically calling out the need for tailored surveillance, recognizing the potential harms associated with recent biopsies and other measures, and improving the means of communicating the option of active surveillance to patients. I can tell you just as a practicing urologic oncologist, it's a long conversation to explain to someone why we think this is a good option for them. And, and certainly we could improve the educational materials that are available and the, the general knowledge of surveillance as an option. Uh, related to that are improving methods to assist patient decision making. And there's a burgeoning field of research in decision aids and decision support interventions that are probably uh, going to have a large role in this setting. Uh, particularly for preference-sensitive decisions like prostate cancer treatment, I think those kinds of things have a lot of uh, a lot of promise. We really don't understand uh, in real-world populations, not necessarily just from referral centers, uh, much of why men accept or reject active surveillance. And I think a, a lot of work needs to be done to better understand uh, the decision-making process in this setting. And finally, the short and long-term outcomes uh, need to be better defined and a variety of different studies are underway and, uh, using population-based cohorts and comparative effectiveness research studies that will hopefully improve these, uh, the knowledge of this area. And finally, there's a burgeoning field of biomarker development to, develop, to identify indolent versus aggressive disease, 
Uh, however, as with many areas of oncology, I think there's a great open question of how uh, Medicare reimbursement and, and payer reimbursement will affect these molecular diagnostics and the dissemination of them and their ability to help us improve care. So overall, I think uh, active surveillance is a, a great option. We use it a lot in our practice. I think our field is, is embracing it as a way to respond to the reasonable concerns about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And a big part of this effort is uh, encouraging patients to become involved in their own rescue and helping to educate and, and, and make the rationale for these options a little bit clear. So in summary, we do believe that PSA screening has benefits, but recognize that overtreatment may occur. The question of PSA screening and the role in prostate cancer care uh, is one where we believe completely eliminating it would really uh, be a, a great liability to uh, the health of many thousands of men. We, we think that active surveillance could reduce the rates of overtreatment, making population screening more acceptable, and providing us a means of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Given the risk of disease progression, younger individuals should be cautious in the pursuit of surveillance. And also, there's a very recent study uh, came out from the Hopkins group that suggests that perhaps the risk of progression in African-American men with clinically very low risk disease may actually be higher. And so initial research needs to be done in that setting to inform our understanding of the role in the uh, African-American subgroup. So I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you all today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much for that outstanding overview on uh, prostate cancer screening and treatment. Um, I'll open it up right now to the floor. Are there any questions by our folks here or on the phone? Oh, I had a question. Um, my name's Kelly. Um, just um, in your experience, how have uh, the men um, responded to active, to active surveillance when you're um, speaking with them about potentially not being um, treated? How, how, does it, how does that discussion go? Well, I, it's a great question. Um, you know, it, it's... It's, uh, you know, I think, like I said at the beginning of the talk, I, I think for many people, uh, getting a cancer diagnosis is a very traumatizing experience and a you know, very emotional experience, and they may have some, uh, you know, family members or friends or other people who've had cancer diagnoses that had a lot of bad things happen afterwards, and so to kind of be, you know, have that foisted on you and then go to the oncologist and have the oncologist talk about anything other than aggressive treatment, I think for a lot of people is... Um, you know, is, is a, a, a lot to swallow. Um, when we talk to patients, you know, when we, when we see a new prostate cancer patient, we first of all sort of stratify how we talk about their case with them based on the factors that are outlined in the NCCN guidelines. You know, prostate cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. There are some cases that we think need to be treated, um, but there are many that are lower risk, and many men diagnosed with prostate cancer have uh, other competing health risks or maybe are older. And so for a significant portion of men, we think that this is a, a good option, but it definitely requires uh, a lot of discussion and explanation of why we think it's something they should consider. And again, given the fundamental uncertainty of it, there are some people who maybe recognize and appreciate that they have low-risk disease, maybe appreciate that, you know, that they don't necessarily need to be treated by the criteria that we have, but are not comfortable with that uncertainty and choose to be treated. I think the thing that motivates a lot of people to consider it is that, unfortunately, despite all the advances in our technologies and treatments available for prostate cancer, that a lot of these treatments have the risk of side effects and, and you know, significant quality of life affecting side effects related to urinary function and sexual function. And so uh, for some men, that factors into it also. But at the end of the day, I, I think the best that we can do is to try to individualize and personalize the recommendations we make to them based on their personal risk factors, uh, both from the prostate cancer and from other disease problems they may have, and uh, try to inform and educate them about the options. I, I do think it's sort of interesting in my own practice, uh, I would say over the last couple of years, um, the receptiveness or maybe familiarity of patients uh, with this option has, I think, anecdotally increased. And I don't know if it's related to all of the media attention about, you know, overdiagnosis and overtreatment of prostate cancer related to the task force recommendations or 
or just general, you know, increased knowledge. But compared to, say, five years ago, I, I, I found more patients nowadays actually maybe already knowing about this or coming in the door hoping uh, or, or being interested in this as, as an option for them. So I think there's some changes are kind of afoot. Thank you. Great answer. Any other questions today? Again, I really want to thank you for this really lovely overview of um, this very ultra-common problem, uh, as well as some of the challenges that we can all face when interviewing patients such as these who come in with a very varied uh, understanding of what their options and preferences could be. Um, so thank you again for your time and expertise this morning. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay.